A proud supporter of this program, Riverbend Food Bank's vision is a hunger-free Iowa and Illinois. Wheeland Presley Funeral Home and Crematory, a proud supporter of WQPT, has been serving Quad City families since 1889. Now providing live stream capabilities for viewing your loved one's funeral or memorial service at their chapel in Rock Island. Challenging the governor on sheltering in place, two area lawmakers speak out about the COVID-19 impact in the cities. As we enter May, we enter another month of social distancing, but this could be a big change this month. Though we're seeing more cases of COVID-19, we're also seeing a growing effort to relax state mandated restrictions in both Illinois and Iowa. But it comes as lawsuits are being filed against Governor J.B. Pritzker of Illinois. And where is the legislature while all this is unfolding? I talked with State Representative Mike Halpin, a Democrat from Rock Island, and State Representative Tony McCombie, a Republican from Savannah, about the impact on the coronavirus now and in the weeks ahead. Thank you both for joining us. And let's start with you, Representative Halp. And uh, we're seeing challenges to the governor's extended stay at home order. What do you say about that? And what are you hearing from constituents? Uh, you know, we get an email or two uh, asking that the uh, governor's order be relaxed. Um, I think the, the challenges in the, in the courts uh, aren't really going to see success in the long term. I do believe the governor has the authority to declare when a disaster exists, and uh, looking around, it certainly does exist. Uh, we need to make sure that we are following the, the CDC guidelines when it comes to when and how businesses uh, that are not essential should be reopening. Uh, we need to make sure we have the capacity for increased testing so that we know where this disease is and be able to uh, trace people uh, and their contacts once they do test positive and work back up that chain to try to reduce the risk to as many people as possible. Uh, I think well, Representative McCombie, I'm sorry, R Representative McCombie, I wanted to ask you is that it really seems like the key right now is getting these tests out so we know who's got COVID-19 and who doesn't necessarily have it. Well, and I think that the testing is increasing, and I think uh, what was just a few days ago that the governor announced that they were finally reaching their goals of the number of tests per day that they wanted. And so that's also where the challenge is and where the I think part of the confusion is because um, the numbers are, are increasing of positive cases because our tests are increasing. Uh, so to say uh, that our numbers have to go down consecutively for 14 days is not going to happen as our test numbers go up. So um, I'm getting I'm getting more uh, emails and phone calls and messages, um, not necessarily saying, you know, open up the floodgates, but is there a way for us to safely, responsibly um, open up uh, in phases, you know, whether it be regionally and to look at, um, look at the science and to figure out a way for our small businesses to open. You know, when they're talking about opening up uh, retail space for curbside and internet, well, a lot of our retail already started that, our small retail, so um, that wasn't really a new open for them. Um, it just doesn't seem like uh, some of the steps that are in this executive order um, are really a regional step to reopen some of those, uh, those kinds of businesses, and I think that's a, a, a misstep that we're, we're really going to continue to hurt uh, our smaller businesses. Well, and Representative Halpin, that is, that is a point, is that we have, I believe, about uh, six counties in Illinois that have had no COVID-19 cases. I mean, is this a time to perhaps look at opening up regions rather than making it a blanket statewide um, ex ex expanded uh, shelter in place order? Well, as we've seen, Jim, uh, and Representative McCombie brings up the testing issue. In a lot of these counties, there may not have been tests available. Uh, it's true that there are, uh, may be some counties with zero or low confirmed cases. But the reality is that the, the disease is already here. And as we test more people, we are going to find more positives because we're going to discover that the virus has been here all along. And that, that actually increases the problem, uh, but at least it gives us better data with which to act. Some of these rural counties, although they may have fewer confirmed cases, they're disproportionately older. They're also disproportionately have a lack of access to 
uh, hospital care in many cases, having to drive many miles. Uh, so this is, this is a consistent problem for our rural communities and uh, we, would, we were fortunate to some degree in Western Illinois to be able to shut down and have the stay at home order before things did get very bad. And we want to do everything we can to make sure people are protected and not to uh, open ourselves up where it can become a problem again. Representative McCombie, I know that the Republicans are calling for at least an opening of the state legislature right now because uh, the checks and balances system, who's keeping an eye on this executive who's making executive orders, is that something you're strongly recommending happen sooner rather than later? Yeah, and I don't think it's necessarily just Republicans. I think maybe just Republicans are the ones saying it out loud. Uh, I, I, think it, I think we all want to get back to work. We all have bills. Um, and I, I, think, I think Representative Halpin would say, yeah, he's got bills to, to do for his constituents as well. Um, we all want to get back to work, but we all want to do it in a safe way. We're, we're fortunate in, in Springfield. We have a, a very big uh, gallery and uh, house floor, and I think there is a way that we could go back to doing business that would be safe for all of us and our staff. Um, they're doing it in uh, a lot of states around the nation, and I think there's certainly a way for us to do that. Also, I, don't, I personally don't understand why the governor would want to continue to um, run the state by executive order when he has a, you know, in the House, 118 different opinions, and maybe that's why he doesn't want it, because it is 118 different opinions, but he has a lot of knowledge there that he could utilize and have us help him um, determine what is the best way uh, for us to figure this out together and for us to help him carry the water. Uh, I certainly would want that, and I, I think that would be the best way to go. Um, I don't know why anybody would want to continue just to keep declaring 30 days and 30 days and 30 days. And I also agree with Representative Help, and a lot of this is about rural access, and we are learning more and more about the virus, and that's another reason I think it's very important for us to be able to uh, regionally uh, and responsibly reopen in, in some cases. It's not going to make sense in some cases, like it doesn't make sense today in Iowa. Some places are open and some places aren't, and uh, how you open, whether it be 50 percent and some, some businesses that have the ability to open still are not opening. And I think that's great that they have that ability to uh, make that choice. And I think that's, that's a big piece of it too. Mike, I want to continue on this topic of checks and balances for the governor. I mean, do you think the legislature should be in session right now just to be an extra eye on what's going on in the executive branch? Well, Jim, I'm certainly willing to be down in Springfield uh, in, a, in a safe way as possible uh, to try to continue to do the people's business. Uh, there are many more folks across the state making greater sacrifices than, than we would be. And I'm happy to uh, try to inform the governor of what people in uh, my district would like to see happen. Um, at the same time, I have been in contact with his agencies and his office uh, directly to kind of pass along what we're hearing here in the Quad Cities. And we've had some success. Um, many of the issues and the relaxation of the executive order uh, he uh, put in effect for this month uh, were things that came out of constituent concerns and local government concerns uh, from here in the Quad Cities and across the state. But uh, I'm certainly happy to go to Springfield if the governor and the House and Senate leadership decide that that's the best way to uh, move, the, move the state forward while keeping us all healthy. Uh, I think it's something that we could certainly consider. Well, Representative McCombie, you've got, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, you've got two hot spots inside your district. One is the Tyson Meatpacking Plant in Johnson, the other being the Thompson Federal Prison. Let's start with uh, the Tyson plant. Um, you've heard that that's now kind of a hotbed for some of the cases uh, that have affected Rock Island, Whiteside, and uh, Henry Counties. Are, are, are you at all concerned about operations continuing there, even though the federal government and the president have said now that meatpacking plants such as that one are vital to the nation? Well, I think uh, the, in Jocelyn, they already had their downtime. I believe it, oh gosh, don't quote me on the dates, but I think the, the processing and the harvest already went down and they did a, a full clean and the, the processing went up first and then the harvest went up. They've put in um, the recommended um, uh, fixes, I guess that you could call them fixes or precautions, you know, different indoors and outdoors, up the janitorial uh, precautions in between. Uh, you know, I don't know if you've ever been through there, but it is, it is a very tight packed, um, you know, arm to arm situation for, for the staff in, in some parts of that through the processing. So it is going to be hard for them to, uh, 
to really do that in you know, a, a six foot social distancing. Um, but they've really done a good job, I feel, um, and their absentee is starting to uh, be better and people are feeling more comfortable going to work. Uh, and that might be the new way that they do business forever, uh, which I don't think is necessarily a bad idea. Uh, I think anywhere, whether it be uh, a processing uh, place, a multifamily, a nursing home, those are potential hot spots regardless. And those are places that we have to have, uh, we can't wait for them to be uh, have a positive COVID case. If there's multiple people there, we have to, we have to think that that is where there is going to be um, a, a hot spot generated. So we have to act proactively, not wait for it to begin. Prisons, of course, are the same thing. And I know it's a federal prison at Thompson. Federal prisons have to accept the prisoners that they are getting through the uh, federal prison system. As you heard, there have been uh, prisoners that have been arriving uh, from uh, the Chicago area. And there are some concerns about whether or not uh, uh, you are just spreading the virus into the Thompson prison. The uh, right. Bureau of Prisons pointing out that they do have a system in place to make sure that these prisoners are isolated when they first arrive. Are you satisfied with what's going on at the Thompson prison right now? Well, uh, God bless Facebook. That's how I found out about it uh, this weekend. And I know that um, Bustos and Durbin both put out uh, statements on it and we have followed up to ask some uh, additional information. Uh, we don't know that the people that were transferred there were COVID positive or if they were going to be vulnerable to COVID and that's why they moved them there because there was no positive cases. I mean, there's a lot of unanswered questions, very similar to a lot of unanswered questions in the Illinois DOC situation um, with us letting out about 3,900 uh, folks uh, for a combination of different reasons. So yeah, there again, it's a, it's a, it's a correction center, a prison, um, and there's always gonna be a concern, um, not only for uh, the, the inmates, but for the staff. Uh, so we have to make sure that we're being proactive and taking all the precautions that we can we can take because you don't want that coming out of there and then coming into our communities where there is not a, uh, a real big concern at, at this point where Representative Halpin was talking about, especially an older population uh, where it is proven to be, you know, the more vulnerable, vulnerable population. Well, and Representative Halpin, Representative McCombie just pointed out the state system and the and the uh, corrections department for Illinois releasing about 4,000 different inmates. My understanding, 64 of them had murder convictions on their records. I was looking at the list for our area, many of them being uh, various type of drug dealers, uh, some violent offenses as well. Um, there, there is a lot of concern being voiced uh, across the state about the release of some of these prisoners and whether that was a smart thing to do. My understanding is that uh, all of these releases go through the, the official board, which makes recommendations to the governor. And I think the governor has said on several occasions that uh, he takes into account all of the factors uh, that should be taken into account, including risk to, to reoffend, risk to the, the public, and then risk to uh, those particular inmates and, and fellow inmates uh, where we have seen a large increases in the number of cases. Uh, I believe that the the governor has uh, good advisors and the board does a good, good does good work, and uh, I think each of these need to be looked at at a case by case basis. Uh, I'm not going to second guess the governor or try to try to grandstand on the issue. Um, we're going to follow this uh, closely and and see what happens. But the the goal at the end of the day is to make sure as many people in the state of Illinois uh, are safe and protected from this disease as possible. Representative Halpin, I know that Representative McCombie had sent out a letter along with, I believe, five other members, uh, female members of the legislature, in fact, uh, calling for a, a greater relaxation of uh, some of the uh, restrictions that are going on in Illinois. And she had pointed out the state parks at that point. Some of this has been now done by the governor. As we enter and go get into the month of May with some of these relaxed restrictions, are there particular areas that you see that need to be opened sooner rather than later? One of the big issues that we've seen is recreational. So I'm glad that the governor has decided to open up some state parks and trails. Uh, we are looking to try to get uh, something a little bit closer to the, the Quad Cities. Uh, in particular, I know the village of Milan uh, operates their pathway through town. 
and it's a short section of it is technically within a state park and had been shut down under the prior order. We are trying to see if we can get that relaxed and get allow people to get some fresh air uh, and walk along uh, the river uh, in Milan. Uh, I also am, am trying to get the Department of Natural Resources to relax the two-person uh, fishing uh, and boating uh, requirement. I believe that if you have a family that has been sheltering uh, together and staying at home and following those guidelines, uh, but you'd like to get out the three or four of you and, and fish together, I think you should be able to do that. So we're going to continue to work with the governor's office on those recreation issues. Uh, we are also trying to protect uh, the, the ability of small businesses to operate as safely as possible. And we're going to we're going to continue to work with the governor's office. He's been receptive in the past, and I believe he will continue to be in the future. Representative McCombie, I mean, we are obviously entering the beautiful days of spring, heading into the summer. When it comes to recreation, I know that you had one of the state parks opened. Are you satisfied at least with that movement uh, for recreation across the state? Well, and I'm coming with good news, and I don't know if Representative Halpin knows it yet, but, and it's really, I think, the call of the people of Illinois, uh, and people think sometimes their voices don't matter, but their voices really did matter in this particular case. Uh, when uh, the Illinois DNR came out with their initial list, uh, Today, they did open several more uh, parks. Uh, the list will be announced later today, but I can tell you in District 71, uh, the Palisade State Park, the Hennepin Canal, um, Prophetstown, um, and uh, Franklin Creek. So your, your, your park may be open, uh, Representative Halpin. So there are several others um, that have been open today. So I'm ecstatic um, that the Illinois DNR and the governor has listened to the, the people's voice because that's why we have one and people feel very discouraged right now and feel they don't have a voice and I think that's a great reminder that we do. Uh, so I am, you know, it's May Day. I feel very happy um, that, yes, I'm ecstatic that that, is, that has happened. Um, Representative McComey, I mean, do you think this question? is a case <laughs> that, that uh, state government uh, um, reacted aggressively in March and April to close facilities down, to, to keep people staying indoors because it was the beginning of the pandemic and there were so many unknowns. Do you think it's a case that we now know at least a little bit more and so there's a little bit more safety that we have? Yeah, I absolutely believe uh, we knew very little. Um, I, I believe uh, nationally and I believe on a state level, we did what we needed to do. Um, and I do believe that there should still be some guidelines in place. And um, I personally am not opposed, and you know, some people are gonna be upset. I, I'm not opposed to, to the, the face coverings. I, they're very limited, I don't, I, what, or, you know, open on what you can choose. And if you have a medical uh, issue, you don't have to wear them and you don't have to go into places that you know, want them, just like you don't have to go into a restaurant if you don't wanna wear shoes. Um, this is a temporary situation. Um, but we're, it's not about me and it's not about you. It, it's about protecting those that are most vulnerable. You know, my ask is, is that we're doing the things that we need to do to protect the most vulnerable. So I'm going to ask the most vulnerable to stay home. Um, and, and that's one thing that I'm not necessarily always seeing um, and uh, hearing from when people call my office either when they're questioning some new guidelines, um, why, why people get to go out and about when they're also going out and about. Um, you know, there's the stores have opened up senior hours and different things to accommodate that population. And I would recommend that they utilize those those times that have been opened up for them just for the interim until we can get through this. But I do think we can relax. Um, it makes no sense that we can't go to our, our small retail shops um, in you know, in our small communities or even in our larger communities, if they're following um, social distancing in and outdoors, uh, people are so respectful of each other. Um, it's 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 time to, to look at those, um, talk to our local officials, our county uh, health departments, work with them, and see what's best. And if it doesn't make sense, it doesn't make sense to do it. Representative Halpin and Representative McCombie, in the few moments we have left, I want to talk about perhaps what the biggest issue is for Illinois once this uh, COVID-19 crisis is over, and that is the state budget. Um, as you well know, uh, the governor saying that they're expecting a $7 billion, perhaps a $10 billion shortfall when all is said and done after uh, the next budget year, so over the next two years. Representative Halpin, what do you say? I mean, we're going to be seeing a lot of cuts. 
Uh, I would think. Um, you're going to see a redistribution of where that money should be spent. I mean, are the hardest times for the state of Illinois really still ahead? Jim, it's going to be extremely difficult uh, to meet the needs of the citizens of Illinois and provide the services that they expect and deserve. Uh, we are going to be doing whatever we can to make sure that the, the federal government is helping the state of Illinois as, as it, I hope it will hope uh, will help many of the other states that are in similar situation. Uh, states across the country, regardless of their politics, are going to be affected by this for a long time. Um, but we're going to do the, the tough work. We're going to make the tough decisions. Uh, we're going to try to work together to, to uh, get to a budget that uh, protects the people of Illinois to the best of our ability. And I'm looking forward to, to doing that work and uh, doing what we can to keep moving us forward. When you say you're going to have to make the tough decisions and, and that Illinois residents are going to have to face some tough times, what do you mean by that exactly? I mean, what will we see? Fewer state police? We'll be seeing, once again, less help for higher education, um, home health care, all those things that we saw during the two-year budget impasse. Is that going to become our new norm again? I certainly wouldn't say it's going to be our new norm. Uh, but some of the uh, difficulties that we saw at the time of the budget impasse, where we, under Governor Rauner, we were spending more uh, than we were bringing in. Uh, because of court orders and, and, and other issues that, that came up. Uh, if, if we aren't able to get the assistance that we need uh, from both the, the federal government, then we are going to have to go back to some of those situations. I do foresee uh, the, the bill backlog growing, unfortunately. Um, but if we get the help that we need and that other states are also getting, uh, I think we may be able to avoid some of the worst uh, of that that we saw you know, two years ago. Representative McCombie, I ask you the same question, but I ask it in a different way, I guess, is that Senate President Don Harmon, of course, is now asking for more than $44 billion of a, a bailout from the federal government, which a lot of people think you're never going to see. Um, it, some kind of federal help, I'm assuming, would be welcome, but it really is an Illinois problem, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I, I also want to add on the, the $7 billion uh, budget problem that we, we could be looking at. That's also a, a proposal on a budget that was recommended in February by the governor. And we all know uh, the budget that's recommended by every governor um, forever has never been passed. Uh, so that rec that is on that. And also if the graduated income tax is passed as well. So that, that number could could change. Um, as for the, the ask from the Senate um, Democrats, that was a push. Uh, Illinois, of course, I think was one of the first states to make that ask. And I certainly don't think that the, the federal government, which is all of us taxpayers, uh, would have to cover our bad management over the last four decades. I don't think that's, that's fair for us to ask. I think one of the, the asks that would have been fair would have said, you know, the uh, $4.9 billion that's coming to the state of Illinois for the CARES Act um, that is going to be spent on COVID-related was to uh, free that up and so that we could use that for not necessarily COVID-specific, like let's say face masks or gowns, but maybe COVID-related expenses. Let's let the federal government loosen that up because we probably won't get to that $4.9 billion. So let let us spend that money for things like unemployment insurance. Let us help build up that trust uh, um, account back up. Different things there. Give us some freedom there. Um, give us a date for uh, the Medicaid rather than us not knowing so we can be able to do some budgeting. Um, maybe roll back um, or hold on uh, raising the minimum wage or or different things like that. Just give us a just give us a minute. Give our, our superintendents and our educators um, time next year. Give them some from uh, some freedom from mandate relief so that the teachers can get, get their kids caught back up and not have to worry about all the mandates on assessments and on the teachers. Um, so there are some things that we can do on efficiencies that I think are going to help bring down uh, the overall cost. Um, but for us to ask the government for a bailout um, that's not COVID related, that, that's because of bad management, I don't think that that's fair. I think it is okay for us to ask um, and whether or not we receive it or not on COVID related is, is a different ballgame. And Jim, right, I, I don't think I'm suggesting... I'm sorry? I would just say... I would just say... I, I don't think we're suggesting that uh, bailout be beyond 
uh, what COVID is doing to our state. Frankly, we passed a balanced budget last year. We passed budgets the two years before that. And we've made a pay pension payment every year, uh, all of our pension payments, every year that I've been down in Springfield and Representative McComey has been in Springfield. So what we're asking for is federal assistance with the economic impact that this disease has had on us. State Representative Mike Halpin of Rock Island and State Representative Tony McComey of Savannah. As of this week, about three out of every five people in Iowa and Illinois have filled out the U.S. Census form. The rate in the cities ranges from almost 70 percent in Henry County to 65 percent in Muscatine. So we ask the question, have you been counted? The census counts everyone in this country, and that really means everyone. A hospital patient, yes, that person counts. Newborn Benjamin, yeah, little Ben now counts. Two families that live in the same house, sure thing, they all count. Or David, who's living in his cousin Daniel's garage, he also counts. The census counts everyone to make things better for all of us. Why should I care about the 2020 census? Every 10 years, the census counts everyone living in the U.S. Count everyone living with you. Even kids! Our numbers help shape funding and services. For all these things. That's a lot of stuff. Your responses are safe and secure. No matter who you are or where you're from. We have reasons to care. Shape your future. Start here at 2020census.gov. We want to remind you that WQPT has some great online resources for you and your family right now. Go to our website at WQPT.org to learn more about the PBS Kids program. It includes several interactive apps and games that make learning fun. Plus, check out PBS for Parents with online resources, including a section that helps moms and dads talk to their kids about the coronavirus. It's all free and family friendly, so check it out right now at WQPT.org. On the air, on the radio, on the web, and on your mobile device. Thanks for taking some time to join us as we talk about the issues on the cities. A proud supporter of this program, Riverbend Food Bank's vision is a hunger-free Iowa and Illinois. Wheelan Presley Funeral Home and Crematory, a proud supporter of WQPT, has been serving Quad City families since 1889. Now providing live stream capabilities for viewing your loved one's funeral or memorial service at their chapel in Rock Island. 